Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to Architects Not Architecture. This is the 12th event of our virtual world tour and we are delighted to virtually travel with you to Mexico City. We are very excited to be hosting our first event with a focus on Mexico because there are many great Mexican architects doing excellent projects. We love this opportunity. Viva Mexico! Today, we will get to know two of them as we will have the great honor to welcome Gabriela Carrillo and Enrique Norton to our stage. We hope you are as curious as we are to hear what they will share with us. I'm Fermin Tribaldos, I'm in Hamburg, Germany right now, and I will be your host for the next one and a half hours. Hablamos Español, but this event will be hosted in English to make the content accessible to everyone. Before the pandemic, we were doing in-person events in several European cities. And although we really missed meeting our community in a real auditorium, we are thrilled to now be able to reach people all over the world. And thank you for joining us. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me briefly introduce our format. At Architects Not Architecture, we do not focus on architectural projects, but on the individuals who designed and built them. We often know the projects and awards of renowned architects, but what we often miss out on are the people behind them. It is them and their unique personal history, which influence how they work and what they create. So we try to bring to the stage what too often remains unseen. Today, our speakers will talk about their career paths, their influences, and the experiences that shaped them and made them become who they are today. And the main rule is, they are not allowed to talk about their own projects. With this virtual world tour, we are taking you on a tour around the globe to meet some of the most influential architects of our time and get to know them on a personal level. Before we dedicate ourselves fully to Mexico and two of its most remarkable architects, I would like to remind you that our next stop of this virtual world tour will be Denmark next week. We are going to share with you fantastic news very soon, as we are already working on the next series of, let's say, activities. It will be much more interactive and it will be very cool. Make sure you follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter on our website so you don't miss any upcoming news. This event is kindly supported by Skyframe and Arauco, both of them very active in Mexico. We thank them for their trust in us and our work. We have video messages from them and let me start by passing the mic to Urs from Skyframe. Hola, soy Ursi Sanchmit de Skyframe México y me da mucho gusto darles la bienvenida a este evento de arquitectos, no arquitectura con los arquitectos Gabriela Carrillo y Enrique Norton. Skyframe es una empresa familiar. Sus oficinas y planta de manufacturación se encuentran en Suiza, en donde hacemos diseños arquitectónicos a la medida. La promesa de la marca es a view, no the window. Skyfo fue fundado en el año 2002 y se ha establecido entre los arquitectos y desarrolladores como el principal proveedor de sistemas minimalistas con un puente térmico. Para nosotros es importante que nuestros clientes reciban el mejor servicio desde la planeación hasta la entrega. Tenemos distribuidores en México especializados, capacitados, que pueden ayudarles a resolver cualquier problema de ingeniería y de diseño. Desde nuestra llegada en 2016 a México, con el apoyo de nuestros distribuidores, hemos realizado proyectos en toda la nación, así como en las principales capitales, la Ciudad de México, Monterrey, y en desarrollos arquitectónicos en las playas como en Los Cabos. Skyframe ofrece diversos productos. Nombrando algunos, tenemos el sistema clásico, el sistema plane, puertas pivotantes y hasta un sistema anti -huracán.
Los invito a que conozcan nuestros productos y que disfruten la experiencia de este gran evento. We would also like to mention the support of our media partners, Arc Daily, Arc Daily Mexico, Arquinect, Fabrica de Ciudad, Revista Ambientes, Basler, Arquine, and Design Boom. Today, we are welcoming our speakers, Gabriela Carrillo and Enrique Norton. Each of them will have 30 minutes on our virtual stage, 20 minutes to give a talk, followed by an up to 10 minute interview. After the two talks, we will have a round of discussion where we will ask some of your questions, so make sure you get ready and use the box on our website to send in your questions. You will find it on the right side when scrolling down. That's the plan for today. Before we start, let me pass the mic to our partner, Arauco. Somos una empresa con más de 50 años líder en el desarrollo de productos forestales renovables que inspiran a crear soluciones destinadas a mejorar la calidad de vida de millones de personas en el mundo. Tenemos presencia con oficinas comerciales en 33 países alrededor del mundo y nuestros productos se comercializan en 80 países, llegando con un servicio de calidad a más de 4,120 clientes. Contamos con un amplio portafolio de productos ideales para proyectos de arquitectura, interiorismo, diseño y carpintería como la melamina, MDF, triplay y madera. Nuestros productos provienen de bosques manejados de forma sostenible y con procesos de producción con los más altos estándares de calidad a nivel mundial y múltiples certificaciones. En 2020, Arauco logró convertirse en la primera empresa forestal del mundo en certificarse como carbono neutral, lo que representó un significativo aporte para enfrentar la crisis climática. Los tableros de Arauco Melamina fabricados en México cuentan con protección Virus Nano Protec, una nueva tecnología de nanopartículas de cobre que elimina hasta el 99.9% de virus y bacterias, protegiendo a las personas que tienen contacto con la superficie. Además, pueden ser solicitados bajo pedido con certificación TSCA y FSC. Contamos con más de 50 diseños con distintas texturas que se adaptan a cualquier estilo. Nuestros tableros de melamina están disponibles en sustrato MDF, PBO y MDP, material ideal para el diseño y fabricación de espacios interiores como cocinas, closets, puertas, habitaciones, revestimientos de muro y fabricación de mobiliario. Potencializa tus proyectos con diseño e innovación. Arauco. Renovables para una vida mejor. Our first speaker was born in Mexico City. He received a Bachelor of Architecture at the Universidad Iberoamericana and obtained a Master's Degree in Architecture from Cornell University. In 1986, he founded his own practice, Ten Arquitectos, beginning a commitment to the creation and research of architecture, urbanism and design. Throughout his career, he has been widely awarded. He received, to name a few, the Richard Neutra Award for Professional Excellence by the California State Polytechnic University, the Trayectorias Award by the College of Architects of Mexico City, the Legacy Award in Design by the Smithsonian Latino Center, and the Leonardo da Vinci Award issued by the World Cultural Council. He was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania with a Miller Chair since 1998 and a professor at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico, as well as visiting professor at the Yale School of Architecture, the Harvard Design School, and many more. In 2018, he was recognized with the highest distinction of Mexico's National Institute of Fine Arts, the Fine Arts Medal of Architecture. We are very excited to have him participating today. Welcome, Enrique Norten.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure being with all of you. Uh, thank you very much, Fermin, Kim. Uh, a pleasure, uh, an honor being with you, Gabriela. And uh, well, I hope uh, we can uh, uh, we can share with you. Uh, I would say some thoughts as they have been requested. Uh, I must say that uh, I was sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a sort of an, a very interesting format uh, because what you guys have asked me to do is not to speak or not to show any projects or basically not to, not to discuss any of my projects and not to show any of the images of our projects and to try to share with you sort of like a more private uh, a part of myself, if I understood it well. Uh, I will, as I have asked Fermin before, I will try to be very short. I'll try to put sort of my life in context so you understand where I come from and who I am. And I would be very happy to let Fermin or Kim or Gabriel or whoever ask some questions so our conversation can sort of uh, move forward. And I would be uh, able to address whatever is the interests, whatever are the interests of these uh, of this audience. Uh, okay, so as you may know, uh, I was born in Mexico City, uh, in the in the in the middle of last century, in the in the fifties, in nineteen in the nineteen fifties. And I was born in a, obviously in, in a, a great city in a, and in a country that was very, very different to what it is today. It was also, also the world was obviously very different to the world today. I was born in, as I said, in Mexico City. This is me and my father, by the way, a Sunday in Mexico City. I was born in, in a, Middle class, uh, middle class family, uh, went to a, a private school, a very conservative school. And through my, through my life, I had, a, I would say, a, a, a comfortable life, a life with no excesses, but comfortable. It, it, nothing ever was missing, I would say. But at the same time, there was nothing in excess of anything. And uh, I must say that, uh, it was also a life that was very uh, detached uh, from architecture or from the arts. Uh, I had no references to architecture. I'm a son of immigrants. Uh, my father uh, came to, to America after the Second World War, uh, fleeing from the horrors uh, of the war. He, was, he had been born in Germany and because of his beliefs and his, uh, his past, he was forced to, to leave Germany and he ended up wandering around Europe through the Second World War. So he came to, to America. He obviously, like many others, his, um, his uh, objective was to get to the United States uh, nevertheless, he, ne he, 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 he wasn't able to. He ended up, fortunately for me, I would say, in Mexico City, where he eventually got married to my mother, who had been born in Mexico. And that's where I sort of uh, came from. Nevertheless, I should say that I uh, went to, you know, as I said before, a private school where uh, art and architecture uh, were not uh, appreciated, I would say, uh, as the best options for, for sort of like a, a middle class growing boy like I was. Uh, to give you some idea, uh, today, uh, most of my classmates are uh, also in Mexico City and they are the best doctors and the best lawyers and the best engineers. And, my, and I always was a little bit of an outcast for not wanting to participate neither in a family business, which we didn't have, or in one of the accepted professions. 
So uh, I, I was a very late boomer. I came very, very late to architecture, uh, basically because uh, I didn't know what architecture was and I had no references of what architecture was. What I did know is that I was very intrigued by the world. I was very intrigued and I was very interested in knowing how our environment, how our surroundings were sort of put together. I was also very uh, uh, eager to know how things were constructed or how things were ensembled. And I was all, uh, very curious always, I would say, in understanding the physicality of our world. It took me quite a while to discover uh, that uh, all those interests or, or that energy could have been or would have led me to, to this profession. And as I, as, I, I, as I can now look backwards, it was probably, I, 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 I was a very, very lucky person uh, by having the opportunity to eventually discover architecture. Uh, these are my children, you know, the, as, as you may all know, uh, becoming a father is probably the greatest things that can happen to you. Uh, uh, these are they're, they're, uh, uh, the, the engines of my life, you know, for the last, now the, the girl, Sophia, is 27 years old. So this is quite a, a, not a very recent photograph. My son is 25 years old. And they're still, you know, the main, my main motivation, but also they are sort of the, the mirror in which I look at in my life and through them and through their eyes and through their hearts, I sort of, it's what drives me to do architecture. You know, they're both my, my most important critics, but they're also where most of my, my loving energy in my, in my soul sort of lays on. So I, I've been also very fortunate in having these two amazing creatures that now obviously have become adults and they're having, they're living their, a life of their own, but still uh, sort of uh, are the ones that sort of structure my life and my practice somehow. And I'm very lucky to have a, a very good and stable relationship uh, with a wonderful woman that it's my, my uh, other uh, uh, half, my other half, uh, and again, which has given me peace and has given me the opportunity to live in a very equilibrated life. And that allows me to have a, a very, very strong and solid base that again allows me to be able not only in this case to, to move forward in my profession, but also to have the opportunity to have a very rich a life that feeds into my work uh, constantly. And uh, I started, I went then uh, to go back to my, uh, to my uh, upbringing as an architect. Uh, I should say that when I sort of came out of high school, uh, I, I really, uh, as I said before, I had no references. And therefore, and I had a lot of, I would say erratic, information and influences. And I didn't, I didn't understand that I had an opportunity to be an architect and, or to become an architect. First, because I didn't know what that was. I had nobody around me that, that would have given me that kind of information or that could have mentored me. And I therefore started a, a going to and trying many, many different things in my life. Uh, at the time, I was very interested in sports. I was uh, obviously also uh, very active in sports. Uh, then I was interested in many other disciplines. And I guess through my uh, late teens and early 20s, I was sort of trying all kinds of, of opportunities and possibilities that life was sort of putting in front of me, which was also amazing and little by little, I started sort of moving into the fields of design 
And once I, I, I could enter the fields of design, uh, I discovered the opportunity uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, of becoming an architect. I should also say, and maybe that's very important, something that I mentioned at the beginning, that when I was on, on these times, when I sort of was coming out of high school and starting my career as an architect, Mexico and the world were very different. Mexico was a very, very closed country, was a country that had a, 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 a very little relationships with the rest of the world. And so was our culture. It was a, a very, a, a cent, a, a, it was a culture that was only looking into, into ourselves, that were, was only looking inside. I, I, I never left the country until I was in my 20s, uh, but, but very few people uh, would also travel at that time. Uh, I, was, uh, I was very, uh, very centered uh, in, in trying to understand Mexico. And therefore, uh, I started uh, my education also in Mexico. Uh, I, I have many memories from, from that time, you know, speaking to many people. And I should also say that at the time, uh, architecture was seen uh, as, a, as a profession uh, that was sort of a, a only a approachable, let's call it by a, by a certain a, a quote unquote class. You know, we, we in Mexico tend to, to, to believe, or less and less, of course, but it used to be that, that Mexican society or Latin American society, I would say, was very stratified and that, that there was sort of an oligarchy that sort of ruled the country, you know, and I don't mean a political oligarchy, also a, a, a sort of a structure of power. And only those that sort of had a certain, I would call it pedigree, were able to access, uh, to access uh, fields like, like culture and architecture. And obviously me and my family did not belong to that oligarchy. And that was something also that uh, sort of made me, well, uh, I couldn't understand it at the time, but you know, from, from people around me, and I guess now I understand it, why people around me were sort of trying to distract me or detract me from becoming an architect. Nevertheless, finally, I was able to, to find my path and I became an architect and I started working as an architect. Uh, first, I went to, well, obviously to architecture school in Mexico City. Then, uh, although I had a, a, like very good studies and I had the opportunity to have a, a great, I would say a great education at a private university in Mexico. Uh, there also the reason uh, I went to a private university in Mexico, it was because I went to school at the, in the early seventies, which was right after the big student movements of the sixties. And the sixties was a real, uh, parteaguas. I don't know how, we, how you'd say that in, in English, but it was a, a real change for, for, uh, for life and for education and for, uh, I would say the geopolitics uh, of the world. So uh, I, I couldn't go to public school, which was what I wanted to always to do because the public schools were closed uh, for, there were a few years that all of our public schools were basically closed or they were going from from stop to stop, from a strike to another strike, and nothing was happening. So I ended up having to go to a private school. Nevertheless, that gave me the opportunity of having a, a what I would consider a very good a technical, a very good technical education. And I came out through, uh, I, think, I think, very well prepared in, in what I would call the 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 tectonics of our, of our profession, but I would say not the humanistic parts of our profession. When I finished my education in Mexico, I realized that I wasn't ready. Uh, that was also some, I, would, I also call, when I look now backwards, I see it as a, as a moment of illumination. And I decided I needed to continue with my education. 
Then I needed to really do it by myself. And I decided Mexico wasn't giving me more in that field in, in, in a place for to further my education. And I decided to come to the States to pursue a, some graduate degrees. And I ended up going to Cornell University where, a, you know, also all, only by chance I, I ended up there. I didn't select, Cornell was at the time probably one of the most important uh, centers of education uh, uh, for my generation, uh, but I, was, I didn't really know that. Uh, I went really there because Cornell is located in, in, northern, uh, in the northern part of the state of New York. It's a very beautiful place. It's a gorgeous area. I had never been, you know, I had I rarely had left my country uh, by then. I had made very little trips. I knew very little of the world and I just got enamored of the place. Once I came there, I realized uh, two things. One, how important the center was Cornell for the culture of architecture. I, I had two amazing professors that were Colin Rowe, a great historian, and Matthias Ongers, a great German architect. And I worked with them for, for over two years, uh, very constantly and very intensely. And the second part that I realized is how little I had learned in Mexico and how unprepared I was to go on into the fields of architecture. And I spent many, many, many hours, you know, as a, as a library mouse, a mouse in a library, trying to read and trying to understand theory of architecture, criticism of architecture, history of architecture, you know, all of the, the, I would call it the humanities of our profession that somehow uh, I wasn't able to, 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 to work on in Mexico. By the time I had already uh, had, uh, like many of us, had built some little projects in our country. So it was a, a very interesting part because I would come to the States at a moment that I did have, I would say some practical uh, experience but I had really uh, read very little and had been able to reflect very little on the opportunities and the capacities of our profession. Uh, uh, also through those years at Cornell, I, I had the opportunity to really start looking at the world. Instead of looking only inwards uh, to what was happening in my country, defined by the borders of our country, you know, this is obviously, pre-internet, pre-cell phones, pre-any of that. So for those of you who are much younger, you could understand that communications were not even 1% of what we have now. This, what we're doing right now would be just uh, unheard of, impossible, would not be even a dream. When I came back from, the, when I was at Cornell, I would see some crazy engineers running around campus with, stacks of perforated cards. And that's how they used to make some huge machines called computers that would occupy entire buildings, make some mathematical calculations. But that's all we knew about this new world. So it was a very, very different world. What it also gave me was the opportunity to meet a lot of people and to, uh, uh, to meet a lot of people and to make very many friends that are up to, the, up to today, uh, some of my best friends and my best colleagues. This is a, a, a very important photo because here I'm sitting with two of my colleagues, which I always admired enormously through my education. You know, uh, one is Ricardo Legorreta, the other one is Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon. Uh, both I consider, uh, although they were never my school professor, I do consider somehow my mentors. I had a great relationship with them. And uh, that gave me also an opportunity to, to be part of a, a, an important culture of architecture in within our own country. But that was not only uh, uh, happening in Mexico. Uh, fortunately, I had also the opportunity to at the time meet and work with a variety of people, you know, a, a, a great number of people that are still, you know, my colleagues and my best friends. 
This is through a trip in Mexico, and you can see here, uh, just it's it's just a random photograph, but we can see here in the same in the same photos uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Tom Main sitting in the front, Carmen Pinos, Wolf Priggs, Todd Williams, Jean Nouvel, Danny Liveskind. We were all just you know on a on a trip in Guadalajara, Mexico, and that's sort of part of the generation that I grew up with. Uh, I would say globally that we still have an enor a, a very, very strong and close relationship and that uh, they're all people I admire very much. And this is just a, a handful uh, of, of, of them, but it's part of my upbringing in my uh, uh, become structure and becoming an architect, the architect that I have fortunately been able to become. I uh, Then uh, I should say that I founded 10 Arquitectos uh, when I came back after I, I graduated from Cornell. I founded 10 Arquitectos in Mexico City in 1986, 87. And then in 1990, uh, I realized, I, I mean, in 2000, at the end of the 90s, I realized that it was, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, Mexico was starting to open up. This new world of this new digital world was starting also to to connect us with the rest of the world, and that I needed to move forward to a bigger world, and that's when I decided to open my office in New York, which we opened it up in the year two thousand, and since two since that year I have been basically working out of Mexico City and out of New York uh, as two centers, and from those two places. Uh, basically working uh, all around the world. Uh, and that sort of uh, brings me up to today. Uh, you know, everything that happened from there to now uh, are, besides my personal life, are my projects. And I was requested not to talk about my projects. So I'm not going to talk about my projects. I'm going to leave you here. Uh, I don't know if this sets up some sort of a context or if that satisfies what you wanted, Fermin. That is great. But that is great. Uh, thank you for your presentation. We can start now. Um, brief interview. Thank you. That was so nice to hear uh, about your upbringing and your, your influences. Um, one of so the, your beginning, you have talked about your um, children or your family. And I wonder, how do you balance family practice and friends all at, all at once i should say that i balance it very poorly for me i wish i wish i would could balance it better and i must tell you that the more you know as age goes by you know and, and as i'm getting older you know mm -hmm. i start i start more and more appreciating I, what i would say the important issues of life i should also say that this last year has been a great year for reflection. Mm -hmm. and, and now, of course, you know, I'm passionate about, about our practice. Our practice has grown very much. We have the opportunity to have uh, amazing projects, amazing opportunities. We're working on projects that I would have never thought I would even have the opportunity to get close to. You know, really mm -hmm. huge urban project, really important infrastructure project, pro cultural project, and everything's happening at the same time. But also because of the of, of all these years, I've ha I had had the good luck to consolidate a very strong team, a very solid team. As you know, architecture is a is a an effort of a big collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, and thanks to that team, it allows me to do many other things. Also, as, as my practice also changes, also my life has become obviously much more complicated, you know, and you start getting involved in many other issues, you know, academic issues, cultural issues, social issues that you also, that I also need to attend. And most mm -hmm. important is my friends and my family. So more and more, I try to spend as much time as I can with my with my children my children don't live in mexico so i am now in new york but the, the two last day the two past days i had the opportunity to spend time with my son who lives an hour away from here and i'm expecting my daughter is coming tomorrow she lives in europe 
near you guys. Uh, so she's, great. Coming, she's coming also to spend a week here. Uh, so I try to spend a lot of time with them. I like to spend a lot of time with my spouse, with my partner. And very specially, uh, I'm trying to spend more and more time with my friends. You know, I have friends mm -hmm. that have been my friends for 40, 50 years. Some friends I met in school. And I'm trying to spend more and more time with them. Uh, mm -hmm. And really... Uh, I really value, you know, the opportunity that life has given me by the people that have gotten to surround. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, there, there is one question from the audience asking um, a question which could be related related to this because you said, yeah, now I realize what is important and also what is important and also because of this crazy year we all have um, gone through and hopefully it's over soon. Uh, you are in the U.S. and in, in the U.S. So you mentioned before that um, our, during our conversation that life is doing better there. Um, but there's one question from the audience, which is, uh, what is the number one thing you will tell yourself, uh, your younger yourself, Ooh, if you can go back? Uh, what is the number one thing you will tell your younger self if you if you meet Enrique and Enrique and um, Enrique Norton in the 20s. What would I tell, tell him? him? Yes. <laughs> I would tell him, you know, as a professional, because there's probably two answers. As a professional, I would probably tell him something that obviously we don't understand where, when we were in our 20s, is that one, you have to be very patient. That okay. you know, architecture is, is a, a, a life, it's a whole life and it's about endurance. In, 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 in architecture will give you many opportunities if you stay on a right line and if you try to do things the best you can do and if you are just and truthful to your, to your beliefs, to your beliefs and that you cannot rush, that you have to be very patient and wait and work day after day after day and eventually the things that you dream of will start coming in and you cannot rush them. And, and if, if I have a moment more, I will try to explain also why. Uh, architecture is a, is a profession and, and I always say it is a profession, it's not a, an art, it's a profession that, has, that, that uh, also break, comes with very, very important responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and, Definitely. and in order to be able to respond to all of those responsibilities, the first thing you need is to have gained the trust of your people and your communities. And the only way to gain trust is by demonstrating little by little that you can do it. And that takes many years. So uh, that's something that maybe when we're young, we don't understand, you know, I used mm. to why am I not getting those projects? I could do those projects. Why am I not getting those opportunities? I could mm. do this and that. But now I understand that is not the case. You know, now I understand that you need to wait, you need to work, you know, and you need to, to, to be patient. And you need and to, to be, be patient. patient. That was, the, that was the, the, the professional advice. But you yeah. mentioned they, they are yeah. accurate too. Yeah, and to Enrique Norton, the, the human being, I would say that the most important thing, you know, there's two things that I would, that I, I didn't say, I, I wouldn't say I didn't do it, but I would maybe do it with much more careful, is dedicate my life to two things, to beauty and to love. You know, mm -hmm. And those are two huge values that have to be right at the top from the beginning. And that's what I would mm -hmm. advise myself again. You know, just focus on those two things. Other things will be there. But that those sounds great. To nurture and be careful about. There is um, one last question. I have many questions, um, but maybe one last question now um, will be now with 35 successful years, what kind of example would you like to be for future generations? And how do you try to support the young generation of architects? 
Uh, well, the, that's that's a good question. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, let me ask for for the second uh, the second your second question. Let me start with the second question. You know, I'm very also very proud. I would say that I have now the opportunity. Well, for, for first, I've had you know I've been uh, involved in academics all my life, so I've never since the day I. I, I stopped being a student. I started sort of being a very young teacher and up to, up to today. So, so obviously I have a very strong relationship with younger people and with every new sort of generation, which is very satisfying to me. But I also have the, the, the great opportunity that I would say my, my team, my office, I've seen many, many people go through it, and especially, well, many people also in New York, but very especially, I would say that in Mexico, maybe, I don't know when Gabriela comes up, she will have another idea about this because she belongs obviously to a much younger generation. She did not work in my office anyways, but many people of her generation did. And there's many offices of, of her generation that now are doing amazing good work and that we're still very close. So we always consider all of those offices and as an extended family of 10 architectos. And I have the, the opportunity to collaborate with all of those offices. So uh, I, we, we cannot do all of the, you, we cannot attend all the opportunities that we, that we have in front of us, but we have the opportunity to bring in people to work with us and to mm -hmm. keep on uh, nurturing, uh, you know, and I wouldn't say mentoring because they're already, many of them are already too old to be mentored, uh, but, but to be, to keep on sort of providing and nurturing and I'm learning from them and maybe they learn a little bit from me. And this is several, several generations. So there's many generations of architects now, especially in my city, that belong to that extended family that we all get together that uh, in somehow keep on collaborating and keep on participating both academically, professionally, and in many other manners. That's uh, wonderful. So nice to hear that. Um, Enrique, I have many more questions, but uh, for now let's stop here and then continue with uh, our roundtable discussion. So thank Please. you a lot for your talk, it was wonderful. And now we will uh, introduce Gabriela. Please, please. Before we start with our second speaker, I want you to do something. I want you to pick up your phone, okay? Open Instagram and search, search for architects, not architecture, or simply scan this code, architects, not architecture. Okay, found it. Now press follow, okay? <laughs> Are you in China or you just don't use Instagram? Uh, you can visit our website or scan this code to sign up for our newsletter. Now you won't miss any upcoming events. Thank you for supporting us. Our second speaker studied architecture at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma of Mexico. In 2001, she started collaborating with Mauricio Rocha. Together, they formed the internationally renowned Taller Rocha Carrillo in 2011, from which she established her own practice in 2017, Taller Gabriela Carrillo, where she developed public and private projects. In 2019, she started a collective that works with public projects called C733. She has been an academic for more than 15 years at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma of Mexico and others such as Harvard, the WAVE program at the University of Venice and the University of New Mexico. She has received multiple national and international recognitions such as the Emerging Voices Award in 2014, Federico Mariscal Chair in the Faculty of Architecture UNAM the Woman Architect of the Year Award granted by the Architectural Review and the Medaille d'Or Palmares 2019, which is the highest recognition 
from the Academy of Architecture of France. In 2020, she was awarded as Architect of the Year by Architectural Digest Mexico and was finalist for the Emerging Awards by the Architectural Review. We are greatly honored to have her with us today. Welcome, Gabriela Carrillo. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabriela Carrillo. I'm really happy to be here in Architects Not Architecture. Thank you, Fermin and Kim, uh, for the invitation. And thank you for sharing this space with Enrique. Um, well, I, I prepared this presentation as a brainstorm, uh, as a lot of ideas when I started to think of how I arrived to be the person who I am. And I tried to, to do that with some images. So I'm going to start sharing this one, which is uh, a pair of images of geodes and fossils. This, these stones were part of my life since I remember, and it is because my father is a geologist. So I've seen this, uh, these stones and stones every, every day of my life since I was really small. And I think at the beginning that I di that didn't have a connection with what I did in architecture. But now I believe it has a lot of sense and it, a lot of my interests are focused on, on stones. I, I go everywhere where I visit my projects and I'm all the time I, I try to find stones and have them and I'm, and, and I'm curious about that because since I was very small, my father encourages me a lot to take a look to the mountains, to take a look to the landscape. Now I do that with my five-year-old kid and I try to, to take him everywhere and to see and to touch all these materials. Uh, the other stuff that I remember since I was a very small kid is that my, my father as a geologist used to see the territory when we didn't have Google Earth. So uh, he, he has a beautiful room with a lot of photographies and a lot of pictures of the territory. And he has these beautiful stereoscopes where I wander a lot of hours taking a look in three-dimensional views of topographies and aerial pictures. So I think that created a big uh, scenario for what I pursue nowadays. Then the other image that I had is my mother. She, she, she was a girl that was a steward for 11 years of her life. She had traveled all, all around the world. So we got this kind of very commercial, touristic books uh, that, that were in my house. And I was really uh, amazed by, by this very simple, even very economical book of Japan. Since I was a small, I even believe that the Kinkakuhi shrine was my small house. I dressed myself with kimonos and I was amazed with the culture since, since I was a small, I wanted to visit Japan. Unfortunately, I did that until I got 30 years. And, and the other thing is that I love drawing. So I wanted to share with you uh, an, an obsessed with one drawing, which is my favorite drawing in architectural drawing, which is a section. So I did this with, when I was four years and I, I had a lot of sections drawn uh, since that time. Uh, then I, I started to study the university. I went to a private school when I was in elementary school. And then I decided uh, that I wanted to study in the public university, which is UNAM. I want to share you, with you this image because it's not just a great picture from uh, Santiago Arau, which is an amazing uh, photographer. Uh, it's because uh, the campus of UNAM is amazing. It's, it's a really important feature for my career. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, living here and I believe that it was not maybe a space um, 
where I studied very much, but it was a space that I enjoy a lot. I started to work here. My first opportunities, uh, uh, working opportunities were given by the UNAM. And the UNAM is a place where I am a teacher right now. So, and this is also part of the South part of the city where I had lived all my life. And with the UNAM, I discovered this space, which I think it's my favorite space in the city and I think in the whole world. It is called the Espacio Escultorico. I'm always amazed every time I visited it. I went to it every year with my students and every time I can. It's a space that uh, emotionally, I remember the pyramids with it, but at the same time, it's really contemporary. And it puts an eye in the territory, in the geology of the site. And every time you enter, it's like a great silence. And you forgot that it, you're in the middle of a city of 20 million people. And then you can go up in this, in these volumes and discover again that you're in the city. So I think this space is something that encourages me a lot to search in, in what I want. And, and I discovered it very young. So this was very important for me. Then uh, what happened when I started to work, uh, when, I was, when I finished, uh, I started to work very young at 19 years in third semester. And I worked for the university. And then I started to work with uh, Mauricio Rocha, which was my mentor, of course. He was not my teacher, but I started to work very young with him for his studio. And he was obsessed with uh, art. And I think that was really important in my career and in the way I think and in the way I see things because these, piece, uh, these pieces of land art started to, to meant a lot of information for me. And uh, for example, this piece of, of, of Richard Long, which is, talks about uh, the path and the art as, and, and the way to walk through a space and what it means started to signify and, and, and all these land art pieces uh, became a great influence in, in what I wanted to achieve. Then I visited uh, uh, all these places I'm going to show are places that I have been and most of them are my pictures uh, and, I, and I wanted to say that because I think that for architecture you should be in a space. I had discovered that being in, in the place it's not just the picture but it's, it's really important to, to live and, and I wanted to talk about this image because it, it was a very important feature that I visited, the Hatshepsut um, temple in, in Egypt. And it connects all the things that I am amazed, the territory, uh, of course, the intervention of the human geometry, uh, the path and the way it gets in a 3D condition. And when I started to walk through this long path, I remember that it was like 40 degrees Celsius. And when I arrived to the temple, I remember I was deaf. I, it was so hot that I couldn't hear anything. So the experience of leaving the space without hearing nothing, even though I was surrounded by a lot of tourists was an amazing experience. Not very nice, but really amazing for me. And then I started to get conscious a lot about senses. And, and again, connecting to, to silence in that feature or to the senses themselves. When I visited this double negative of Michael Hazers, um, I, it was really amazing because I felt that there was a, a deep silence. I mean, that I was deaf again, but instead it was, a, it was a silence of the desert. And I wanted to show this because these spaces had shown me that things that I want to pursue doing architecture, uh, the senses, the silence, uh, being conscious of things that we have forgotten are really important nowadays in my, in my practice. So I also wanted to, uh, trying to show this idea of pursuing the silence, I, I selected these four scenarios of voidness that had been uh, very powerful in my life. This, patios or these spaces that don't mean square meters. And every time uh, when I started to think what I think of architecture when I started to study architecture was to build things. But now uh, I want 
to be more conscious, I am more conscious and deeply um, in love with the voidness. So these are uh, four spaces of scarpas, uh, the pre-Hispanic architecture, of course, the Espacio Escultorico and the and Ryokhanji Temple, which for me are proportions, silence, deep, uh, deep silence. Um, then on my life uh, in this discover of of, of, of what I was and, and what I was trying to become, um, working with Mauricio. Uh, I discovered his work uh, through his um, um, interventions in, in buildings. Uh, it was very nice because I have seen three of his pieces and he was not doing architecture, but this ephemeral work. And uh, I was uh, I was really impacted with this piece, which was a circle that happened through a house and that connected two trees from one side of the street to a patio behind, and was a forty-five centimeters circle that connects your eye to another thing. And then I I got realize how powerful the voidness is and how just creating a, a void in a wall can def deform and transform a space. So I started to become obsessed with the nolly and with these things about the scale, limits, uh, in and out, uh, of course, measures of elements of, of, uh, of how the scale of the eye is tricky. And um, then of course, I again uh, obsessed with, with a human and with all these artists I had the fortune to meet as Gabriel Orozco, Damian Ortega, Fernando Ortega. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to meet them, to work with them and, and to know this eye, which is uh, really interesting. And now, which I, I, I really, I think was an inspiration for my work and I miss for my work. Um, I am obsessed with Google Earth right now. I, I keep measuring and I wanted to, to show you this image of how I keep measuring uh, everything, every patio, every plaza, every length of a path to understand the relationship of, of measures and perception and spaces where I have been. Um, I'm also amazed and, and emotionally moved by the work of Khan as a great inspiration. And of course, of artists as Rodko, where abstraction is important. And um, again, in this, in this idea of showing this brainstorm of, of a scale as an opportunity to bring things that are very distant from you inside to your project. And I think that's what I really enjoy I love from these masters. I had the opportunity to work with senses. I, I did uh, uh, projects that touch uh, blind people, uh, blind impaired people. And that gave me again the opportunity to, to, to be very concerned about that. So uh, I started um, to be conscious of the codes and the symbols. And I think I am, uh, I am very conscious and I and, and in this case, for example, this piece of pin about, uh, I really love it how how this guy is singing, but at the same time dancing, but at the same time saying so many things because he's what what the the sound is is singing, he's singing with the, the language of the hands. So I, I started to break the limits in that sense. And and this piece, uh, for example, where all the letters, uh, Manuel Rocha's piece, all the letters are 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 erased. And just the, the separation between the the affirmations or the uh, the inter interrogation marks or the distance and and there i see uh, what i i am curved for architecture uh, and what i believe of architecture i'm also very concerned about the gender things and the social issues i am a feminist in a way i'm against uh, the way uh, still, the, the world is designed for a man, a perfect man that doesn't exist. I am against that. I believe in diversity and I want to work with that uh, as well. Uh, I'm very uh, in love with landscape. I don't see the difference between doing architecture and landscape. So Barragans Gardens, Hilitla's Gardens um, are pieces to be um, 
emotional about, but also the landscape of my country is a big inspiration for my work. Uh, also, I love informality. I love the process of construction and the intelligence that people use. And I think Mexican is, Mexicans are a great examples of people with intelligence trying to improve and to use crisis and as an opportunity. I'm also seduced, of course, a lot by the social relationships and the impact of these social relationships on, on our work. So I really believe, for example, this movie of of Lars von Tears, Dockville, where no walls are shown, uh, how you can create the whole city and understand that, that the really city is created by, by society and by what happens behind the walls. Uh, in that sense, Lina Bobardi is almost my goddess. Is, she's, she's for me the best not just the best women architect or the, the best architect, the less modern, the, the most contemporary. And she's amazing because she, she has guided me through her texts, through her words, through her work, as, as she's a signal of liberty for me. And uh, a, a, a girl that was vanguard in her time and that has talked about social issues and community and how architecture is about that. And then, of course, I wanted to show markets because markets are also an important issue. Every place I visit, I go to a market. I'm amazed because I believe they are a reflection of the culture of a place. So I want to eat them, visit all types of of, of markets. I'm fascinated by that. I don't think, I, again, the architecture is sometimes nice, sometimes not, but what really creates this ambience is the culture of the place, the timing. Uh, um, again, a lot of my inspiration comes from what I'm surrounded by. So I wanted to show all these opportunities that my work had given me to visit these beautiful sites, uh, understand, uh, man and the, the the artisanal production of of beautiful constructive systems that I want to learn a lot so I stop a lot seeing that also in my life uh, it was a great influence the earthquake that happened in 2017 um, it was very tough for me especially because I had a small kid and I wanted to teach him and to show him that it was, it's important to to, to, see, to feel empathy with, with the place where we live and to be conscious about that. So I worked a lot. Um, I worked a lot and I had the opportunity to meet a lot of people, to visit a lot of communities that maybe wouldn't be possible uh, in other scenario and to, and to understand a lot the feeling of the people and that distance that sometimes architects have between the people that, for, the, for whom we built. Right, And as Enrique was saying, I think our job has to do a lot with that. Then, of course, the biggest challenge of my life to have a kid and, and then to feel a city that is aggressive when I, was, I felt I was in the best city in the world, in the most beautiful one. And then in that sense, start to be conscious in, and in a way uh, feel uncomfortable and try to think, how can I change or how, what can I do to change that? So I also love the way of my kid. I learn a lot from him, but mainly the way to see. I think I, I admire and I had learned from him that I need to see from other eyes. And I think I started to do that when I was working with the census and with the blind people. And now I am obsessed with that. I, I love these drawings from Bruno Town that when he visits Katsura in Japan. And I also love and enjoy all these type of books uh, where there's an interpretation of someone that I admire about the work of someone else that I admire. For example, Alan Spoh's uh, books uh, translated by Julio Cortázar or simple books as novels as El Principito, which I now can read with my kid. And I think that all of this is a, great, a really great influence from everything. Um, I have a partner, which is, uh, he's not my partner, he's my partner of life um, and father of my kid. And he's an architect as well. And, and I share with him this idea of shadow, light, uh, common sense, 
simple elements. Of course, the work of my colleagues in Mexico is a great inspiration. I think the work that is being done in Mexico is really amazing and, uh, and in all whole Latin America. And, and I think it has to do that we are in crisis. So in a way, we all should, uh, there's a necessity to be intelligent. Uh, I am also seduced a lot, uh, and especially since the earthquake about my city. So I've, ha I've, I have developed a research with uh, my students at the university about the city um, about cracks and all the territory that we have with cracks. So uh, I think it's a great inspiration. As I said before, crisis is an opportunity. So um, I'm of course as also uh, inspired by the work of my students. This is the work they have done in, in the last three years and the, where, the perception of them working and living in the city that we live, uh, which is amazing, as I said, but also uh, powerful and with a lot of problems. And uh, um, just to end, of course, my team, and uh, which is my family as well, and this, as, my, as, as Enrique mentioned, uh, the collaboration and, and a work that we do is, is not a solo work, it's a, it's a whole teamwork uh, and well that's also a great influence for me just to end i would like to add this image which is uh, i started with stones and i ended with stones it's a space called nica that i was obsessed to visit it's a mine it is not open to a tourist i think right now and it is very controlled and i was obsessed to visit it because i i saw these pictures and i wanted to be there and when i went there it was really interesting because i thought i was going to see that image but when i arrived there uh, the image that i have was this and it's because in the inside, the space has 60 degrees Celsius inside. So you can walk inside because every step you give, uh, the temperature starts to get hotter. Uh, so I didn't see anything, but what was really amazing of it is that in just three steps, my whole clothes were wet and I was completely sweating and completely sweat. And I figure out that we are always involved with eyes and we are always searching for images, but the senses and the possibilities that our body can give is what really makes me enthusiastic and, and amazed and, and always trying to search different things about the work that I do. And, and with that, I finish. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you a lot. Um, that was super nice, that collection of thoughts and inspirations. There are so many possible topics to talk about. Um, maybe starting with, with census, because this, this story about this place is amazing, as well as the story about Egypt. Um, when did you start realizing that um, consciousness and uh, senses are so important or will be so important for you as an architect? Well, I think, uh, I think it, it happened a lot of years later than when I started to, to, to study architecture, because I think the all, always the image we have as the students is that, oh, I want to do buildings, right? I want to, to construct a lot of mm -hmm. square meters. And, and I think one of the first ones that I enjoy a lot was this, this visit to Egypt, because uh, it was, I was really surprised. You know, mm -hmm. that happened to me when I ate so much chili, so much chili that I understand why the in the cartoons you <laughs> see people like going uh, uh, smoke through their ears. It's because you get depth. And, and I felt that. And, and it was amazing to see the, uh, the tourist guide speaking and I was not hearing anything. So I said, wow, this is this is really amazing. And this has to do with temperature, of course, and that I, I am sweating and that everything is hot. So I started to get a conscious, but I, of course, the moment that breaks everything was when I needed to design a space for people that didn't see. Yes, so, that's crazy. Uh, if, you, if you focus all your life to study image and to proportions, beautiness, how how the beautiness is expressed when when black is all around no or when blur images are happening and and i got in a deep exploration i interview a lot of blind people i i just sit it there of course fortunately the the library existed so i had the opportunity to sit 
and observed people and how it functioned. And there were people, assistants working there, which were blind as well. So that relationship of people working that we always say, how they do this, you, you see? It's like getting mm -hmm. conscious of this diversity was really important for me. And of course, the last moment is like my kid, you know? Mm -hmm. Like a guy that needs to smell everything. And, and that uh, he, when he hears something, he, oh, the water, mama. So the sound makes something, makes some sense and conscious that we forgot that we mm -hmm. have what we have forgot and i am focusing i think all my energy nowadays on that you mentioned also uh, empathy uh, but this is also so, so difficult to teach i guess when you don't go through uh, uh, specific experiences how do you try to teach uh, empathy to your kid but also to your students for example It is really hard. Team. It is really hard, and I and I believe I think uh, if you get out of the bubble that we usually are. I mean, I am a very fortunate and privileged person, uh, so I had a lot of opportunities, work, food, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that, for example, Dunam, it's a great space. I think it's one of the most democratic spaces we have. We have all the same conditions. We share the same uh, table, uh, the same professors. And that was the first moment where I understand that feature of I, uh, the empathy because the diversity of the people that you mm -hmm. work and do and um, that you share a space, it's enormous. And then with my students, I think I did a lot of exercises. Um, of course, the blind scenario, which is really easy or put themselves in a wheelchair or walk I think you you just need to observe we have stopped observing the place where we live so I did for when for the first semesters not at the last but I did a lot of the exercises of walking through the city and I think mm -hmm. maybe the first year you don't need to draw any project but just to observe and to be conscious of the world that surrounds us. And I talked about informality. Informality is part of our culture, but we wanted to uh, eliminate it. And so how are you going to be em have empathy to that if you just want to erase what you don't mm -hmm. like? You see, so I think the conscious is achieved once you observe and, and, and feel, have more sense about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, there is also another topic you have mentioned, yes, briefly, that was the, um, the, your engagement with gender-based violence. Yeah. And um, what brought you to be so engaged with this topic? And uh, um, how do you try to help? Well, um, first, I, I, it's, it's quite sad because my, um, it's not my, it's my niece. Uh, yes, it's my niece. I don't know. It's not my niece. It's my, how you do you say, say my Spanish. prima? My, <laughs> oh, I forgot I the word. My cousin. cousin. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I lost a cousin. Uh, she was oh. killed by her husband. And it is something yes. that we usually uh, want to erase and we don't want to talk about. I remember that because I was really young uh, when that happened. I was like 20 years. I, now I'm 43. So it was 23 years ago. And I remember how my family got silenced about it. They were, we were scared in a way. My, my cousin had two kids and, and then we, we shut our mouths. You see, it's like what happens, silence. And suddenly uh, I realized that I started to have students, uh, girl students. I see uh, even in my practice, I am very fortunate. I have great opportunities and my gender has never been an impossibility for what I want to do. But I see what happens around my country, which is a very machista. Uh, mm -hmm. I still have colleagues that call me mijita instead of architect and and I figure out that if I'm a man they wouldn't tell me little kid you know mm. um, so I am obsessed now with that and I think it's important to talk 
and to not mm -hmm. get silenced. We are now in, in a paro in the UNAM, unfortunately, because of that. So I believe it's important not to get silenced and to start to change the machinery of this society, which is obsessed uh, with the patriarchal uh, methods of creating a city. And, and now I reflected it to everything, you see? The cities are reflection of everything. I, if, if you Definitely. are blind, you can walk through the city. If you are, have a kid, it's impossible to walk because uh, the, the streets are crazy. So everything, uh, I, I think it has a lot of relationship. I do co a Congress every year, uh, trying to show the work of brilliant uh, women architects. And of course, I am always talking about that because mm -hmm. I think that's enough at least from my small side, to talk about my experience mm -hmm. and to start saying, never shut your mouth, always say. Well, there, there are so about. many great female architects in Mexico. So yeah. we could do many, many architects, architects and architecture events only with female architects. <laughs> um, that's, a, I know. that's great to hear that. There's one, thing, uh, one maybe one last question which might be interesting for people um, who maybe is in a similar situation regarding uh, your experience working at a, you know, at a practice which was successful for many years, but um, founding your own practice. So what is, yeah, maybe directly to this, this question, what would you recommend um, architects who have worked at an office for many years and are thinking of starting their own practice? Well, um, well, I worked for Mauricio's office for 10 years mm -hmm. and we were partners nine years. And I think that architecture is a collaborative uh, mm -hmm. practice, you know, it's not the independence or I think that I could uh, keep working with Mauricio. I mean, I'm still doing some projects with him. We are partners in some projects. Now I have a lot of partners because I am collaborating with a lot of, a lot of studios. I created a colectivo uh, to do project, public projects. So I'm not doing things on my own, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I just want to say that maybe uh, I, I think every path is different. I have a lot of people that have asked me that. My path was that I was very happy working with Mauricio for these 19 years. And that now we got in different paths with different interests. And that's why we keep working. But now I have my mm. office and I am doing different stuff, collaborating with different people. So I think everyone needs to choose how they feel and, and be faithful to that idea. No, once you're feeling comfortable, it's maybe the time to say, I need to do something different. But I think that yeah. work is collaborative. So it doesn't matter. It, I am free now. I'm, I'm really, I feel free because I, feel, I am very happy collaborating with so many minds, you know? And, and the interdisciplinary scenarios and with people with more experience in different stuff. So. I, I don't think there's a straight path. Like there are many yeah, I can imagine that. Good Thank you, Gabriela, for the wonderful talk. Uh, let's um, ask Enrique to join us for the, uh, for the roundtable discussion. Yes. <laughs> so, Enrique, can you hear us if you turn on your microphone? I think not yet, but it will be in a second, I guess. Okay. Now, perfect. Okay. Um, Enrique, I have to say, now you look different. What have you done? I have to change because I need to <laughs> run to a meeting. Also, <laughs> also, also difficult to talk that you were sweating from not talking about projects, but you thought that I need to change my clothes. No, no. I, while, while I was listening to Gabriela's super interesting presentation, I had to change clothes. So I'm sorry. <laughs> No problem. No, no. Um, there's there are some in very interesting questions from the audience, and um, we have also some cool questions for you. We are so glad and so happy that you are participating. So again, thank you a lot for your time. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, pleasure for people. For people, um, for those who have never been to Mexico City like myself, I hope soon. Um, what do you love about the city and which changes would you like to see there? Who will you, who would like to go first? Ladies I first. Start. I can start. Okay, Gabriela. <laughs> well, I really- uh, oh, Sorry, I, uh, that, was not, that was not a very nice feminist comment by saying ladies <laughs> first. 
Perfect. I will call you like that, Enrique. <laughs> From now on. From now on. <laughs> um, Gabriela, go ahead with the, with okay. the answer. Um, well, I really loved Mexico City. I, I think it's a, an amazing cosmopolitan city with the best, best climate in the whole world. In fact, um, I think it's amazing because even though it's a 22 million people all around, uh, it has a diversity of territories. It is like small towns gathered together, everyone with its own um, characteristics and conditions. For example, Coyoacán is really different from what happens in Polanco or Polanco from what happens in San Angel. So, or from La Condesa, which is this very trendy uh, neighborhood. Uh, so I think it's a, a, a tons of cities and towns and times uh, that you can discover in this space. And also with that, all beautiful spaces to, of culture, uh, to, to have great food, beverages, everything. Um, I will say that with this pandemic scenario, I am living nowadays, I used to live all my life in Coyoacán, in the south, and now I'm a little bit in the north, in, in Del Valle, which is not that nice neighborhood. Uh, and it is surrounded by these streets that they opened uh, much more in, at some point. So fluid for the vehicles can be more efficient because of course the traffic is a great uh, feature here. I am very happy to see that the city is, is translating to these bicycles and, and different uh, pedestrian scenarios. And with the pandemic, what happened is that all these axes for vehicles have reduced the paths and now the, that all the restaurants are uh, in the streets and all the parking lots also are in, now invaded by tables and people eating. So I am really happy to see that the use of car is less and less it's reduced. Mm. I think that that has to change because of, of the habits and the dynamics of the city. And I think I wanted and I wish that that can, can be left. I'm, I'm doing that with my own office. I'm not going to go back again as I was and as I used to be for all this time. And, and, and I wish to, to see that maybe more pedestrians, more, more people walking, less cars, uh, more terraces, more open spaces. And I think the pandemic has opened that opportunity. Let's hope that it can keep. I, I'm not okay. sure. Now, Mijito. Mijito. I just keep it. En Enrique. Well, Gabriela, <laughs> Sorry, Enrique. I would agree with, sir, with uh, most of, of, of what Gabriela said. Yes, it's, it's, I, I totally agree. It's the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, the, the weather is amazing. Uh, the scale of its parts, it's, it's, it's very uh, special. Uh, I also would agree that, that uh, Mexico City is more a collection of, I wouldn't call it of cities, but yet of, of, of very, very different barrios with, with, with their own personality. And some of them started being like different towns that sort of got together and created this, I call it this muegano, this Muegano, you know what a muegano is? That's probably a very Mexican. Not me. <laughs> it's a, it's a you should come to Mexico to have a, mue a I, I will, muegano. definitely. It's a candy where it's made of, of different pieces that come together by honey. Uh, but each one of the pieces sort of uh, keeps their own uh, personality. But I would mm -hmm. say, uh, that's, uh, I would say, please uh, uh, don't take me wrong, Gabriel, but it's also a, a kind of a sort of simplistic way of understanding Mexico City, because although it was created that way, what's amazing about Mexico City is really this superimposition of its different layers. It's, a, it's layers and layers and layers and informa of information that somehow they come together and then they allow these sort of transparencies to flow and create those very different moments. So I would say, yeah, they, it's important that there is Coyoacán, there is San Angel, there is Tlalpan, but that's the least important and the least interesting part of Mexico City, uh, because that's sort of like a very sort of way of looking back 
looking back to what the city was, but the future of the city is what makes it really incredible. In it, there, it has a tremendous energy, a, a tremendous, a, I would say, a set of opportunities and possibilities, a tremendous speed of transformation. A, and it's a city that is changing all the time, but changing with a great a underlined order. Uh, people would say, you know, obviously we all complain about our cities and sometimes we get stuck in traffic, but I get stuck in traffic in New York and I get stuck in traffic mm -hmm. in Cairo and I get stuck in traffic in Madrid or anywhere. Uh, but it's really the, the, the way that Mexico City is coming together and changing and changing even its own structure. You know, it's amazing and its own readings, it's amazing. So mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you, you must come, Fermin, it's, it's, it's not an excuse, whatever your excuse is, and it's unforgivable that you as an architect have not been to Mexico City. So please come. We will go with the, with the whole team. Okay, yes, there, yes. Is, uh, there is um, one question from the audience regarding also to Mexico. Um, how do you manage the pressure and the frust frustration of the process to make architecture in Mexico? And can I go first? I would like to Mijito, venga. <laughs> I'll tell you because, you know, uh, it's not about, the, you know, the pressure of making architecture in Mexico is probably much less than the pressure of making architecture anywhere else. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm not talking, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here in New York and the, the, the pressure and the frustration of getting something done in New York is way farther. I've been working in projects in New York that have taken me 18 years from the first line wow. to the day of the opening. So that is frustration. And that is what requires patience and endurance. And obviously there are other frustrations in our country. You know, every place has other kind, other set of frustrations, but I wouldn't say that it's any different to doing, to, to doing architecture anywhere else. Mm. Gabriela. I completely agree. I mean, I mentioned at the end uh, about um, crisis. I, I, I do believe that crisis is a great opportunity to change things and to, uh, 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 it's, it's more a word that I interpret as opportunity. Uh, so I agree completely with Enrique. I think this is a space where you are really free and uh, we have less rules maybe than in anywhere else in Europe or in the States. Uh, it is really easy to imagine a lot of things. I remember when I did the judicial courts in Michoacán, um, there was not the scenario of judicial orality courts in Mexico. So, and there was not even um, uh, some instance that had the rules written of how to build or, or mm -hmm. the, the scale of the corridors or any real rule. So we, of course, the, the, the rules of the the, the rule for the construction feature and and it was really amazing because that was freedom you know you you could imagine anything and and i think in that sense we are it's the best place to do architecture or to do what you imagine um at least for me we mexicans are very, we mexicans are very positive about I see that. yes yes I we are see that. of course <laughs> And we all love we all love our country, we all love our city. Our our country is our city, I would say, because Mexico at the end is Mexico City. I, I know many people would not like to hear that. No. But Mexico City is, is an amazing place, which is very different to the rest of the country. And I don't think you'll hear anybody who's a Mexi who's Mexican not absolutely loving their country. Mm -hmm. And um, now that we are here. With this format, not talking about projects, do you have any question not related to projects that you would like to ask each other? <laughs> well, I just wanted to ask, I, Mijito, can I go first? Sure, please. <laughs> no, she, well, <laughs> she continued with Mijito. I think she's going to do it as, even after the event. No, yeah. Okay. Uh, Gabriela, well, go, go. Uh, I know. It's funny because I wanted to talk about, uh, well, maybe... Um, he talked. He he mentioned in the question that uh, he would suggest for himself as a younger Enrique uh, to follow beauty and love. 
And I was going to ask you, uh, uh, what uh, does freedom mean for you? For, at least for me, freedom is something that I pursue since I was a very small kid. So I, ju I just wanted to know from your side what freedom means and, and how that impacts in your work and in, in your practice. So nice that's a question. question. That's a good question. And obviously, you know, we could use an enormous amount of absolutes, you know, uh, to, to try to define what's important to us in our life. But yeah. the way, why I mentioned beauty and love is because I think those are two absolutes that engulf all the others. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I think that freedom is part of beauty. I think that truth is part of beauty. You know, I think that many other of the values, you know, the equality is part of beauty and love. And I think those are two big absolutes in my life that I think they engulf all the others. I, I also, like you are, we, you know, I have all, always been, I would say, or I would like to, I don't know if anymore, but I was a big rebel. So, and that's what made me be all, always very free. That doesn't mean that it always took me on the right path, you know, but it gave me the opportunity to, to experiment a lot and to make many mistakes in my life. But that's how you learn. And yeah, I think freedom is very, very important. And obviously it's something that we need to keep on fighting always for, you know, in all kinds of freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, you know, freedom of, of access, freedom of all kinds of freedom is absolutely important that will make us stronger. But that does not mean that, you know, in, at least in my hierarchy of values, that freedom is not part of beauty. Of beauty. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Enrique. Mm -hmm. Enrique, do you have a question for her? Well, I, I would have many questions. Some, some of the questions I may have to ask her personally. <laughs> when there's not such a, <laughs> such, a, such, a such a big big audience but uh, I, more than a question i would say that I, I would like to take the opportunity which i've never done you know personally because i've never had a, a very close relationship with with gabriela not that i have not had a, a bad relationship we just have not had the opportunity but really to congratulate you gabriela on, on such a, 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 an amazing career that you're doing, uh, you know, such a great path. You know, you're, you really have become a very important uh, stone in, in the construction of the culture of architecture. Certainly in Mexico, I'm sure that it's, it goes way beyond Mexico as well. And I, I wanna wish you, you know, to, that you can continue uh, working in that in that same road and, uh, and wish you many, many more successes. And, and maybe that will sound very old, but I'm very proud of you and of everybody that I can see coming up of this amazing uh, country and city. Oh, thank you, Enrique. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mijito. <laughs> <laughs> That's so kind. That was so, so nice. Thank you, really. Sure. Um, maybe you can go with uh, briefly with one um, one last question because we have from the audience asking again also about um, uh, opening your own studio and starting as an architect um, do you want to share some maybe I have one question from Enrique for, Enri for that. Enrique um, Hmm. I have one wood one, but I, uh, I don't know where is it. Doesn't matter. Um, what would you tell um, a young architect so as, a, as advice for the beginning in order to start a practice? Well, uh, I would say, uh, I want to say another thing. You know, there, I think there is always a very, uh, it's a huge misconception uh, or sometimes a, a, a wrong aspiration to mm. think that architect that success in architecture is to have your own practice and to be a very strong designer or whatnot. I would what I have also learned through life is that architects have many, many, many capacities. 
and many opportunities in life. And they're important in very many different places. And it happens now that Gabriela has her practice and she's the designer of that practice. And I have my practice and I play a similar role in my practice, but that doesn't mean that that's the only role model to follow. You know, I have huge, huge respect and admiration for all of those architects that as architects, because they work as architects, take other positions in life and play other positions in the field. You know, there's people that work in government and we need those architects, you know, in the government, people that work in construction and we need those architects there, you know, people that work in policy and we need those architects there, people in academia, people doing research, you know, there are so many opportunities all across the board for architects, for architects. And I really hope that we don't, we, we only expand you know, in, in, in filling in all of those positions. And it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. There's no room to, so that every architect in the world has its own practice. And it doesn't really matter. You know, that can be also very frustrating for many people. So I think that what's important is that everyone finds his path and finds his way and finds his niche. So it can, he or she can develop the best way in what they do as architects. We need architects in all those places. So That's I wouldn't true. be that worried about yes or no, opening your own studio. That's not the most important thing. Gabriela, what would you say? You already yeah. mentioned before collaboration as well. Yeah, I mentioned that. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately, I think we uh, prevail and we provoke this idea of one God architect mm. taking decisions, moving the world all around. And that, it's mm. not true, you see? So I think what, what Enrique has mentioned <laughs> is exactly, uh, I, I, I think we should consider. I mean, I love to do, to have my studio, but I don't think I'm on my, on my own, you know? I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm mm. doing a work that is, um, collective work. And I, I think that is the important thing to emphasize. And, and unfortunately, our own way of communicating, showing the work, publishing the work, it's always a, a finger and a name, you know, that that is something yes. that doesn't help, maybe that we forgot to mention all these people that Enrique uh, said that the people in the government or the, the which is important and essential to mm -hmm. the people that writes architecture, the people that the, is investigating architecture. I mean, it's not important at all, but I'm happy being on my own. I need to say that. <laughs> That's uh, so nice to hear from you. Uh, can you al allow me and, and, brief, and briefly and, and another question? Enrique, do you have time for that's a brief question? I'm going to take the last question. I need to run like in seven minutes or something. because I need to uh, We, can, we yeah. can make it. We can make it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One very last question will be for us. Talking about having this opportunity to talk about what what you have done in the past, your, in, your influences, your inspirations, your mentors, your obsessions. What is that that fulfills you the most of what you do in your everyday life? Uh, you mean professionally, of course, right? I mean, whatever you want. <laughs> well, uh, I, really, I really think, and I will say it really from the bottom of my heart, that uh, uh, at this point in my career, you know, what really, what most fulfill, fu fulfills me is to see, a, 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 I would say, the activation and the occupation, both of the space, the voids that we create. By the way, I like very much your idea, Gabriela, about the void. I completely uh, agree with you. And uh, I, uh, I really enjoy, you know, seeing our, uh, our, whatever we have created being occupied and being enjoyed and seeing people running and people being happy and understanding that we were able to, to really contribute, you know, to making our society a little bit better in a certain way. 
And I really mean it. It's not just, uh, you know, words. You know, I, I, I really mean it. I was, as a matter of fact, I had dinner last night, you know, with a client of mine. We're about to finish the, their house, a very large house on the beach here in New York. And it was him and his wife. And they were, they're just so happy and so joyful about it. And I was telling them, you know, what, I'm, what you're telling me is really the reason why I'm an architect. It's so nice. Because I see you so happy, you know, and after all these years of working with this, this is just an example, you know, I can see you enjoying so much something that I could contribute to, to make it happen. And I really mean it. Gabriela, what will be your answer? Uh, I, I completely agree that I pursue that as well. I also want to add two things, I think. I want to to do a work that can put on, on the table questions. I think we are a society that grow with the idea that we should give good answers all the time. So I think that the work that I do, uh, I want to, to put questions on the table and it's more harder to do good questions. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, space uh, architecture can do that. And, and the second would be that, um, I believe in success as, as this um, a, equity or equilibrium between a lot of things. So uh, of, of the work that you do, if you're passionate about it, if you're happy doing it, I believe more in that. Uh, I, I don't pursue to be a millionaire. I, it's not important for me because I believe I have the quality of life I want to achieve. Uh, I had the fortunate to travel, to visit, to eat as if I was a millionaire, but I'm not. My, my work gives me that. Uh, I do, I, 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 it is difficult for me to find the difference between working and, and the playground mm -hmm. where I draw and enjoy my life. And that is quite tricky because I also enjoy spending a lot of time with my family, as Enrique mentioned, this balance it's, it's what's really different to achieve. So uh, I believe that uh, I pursue that and I'm searching for that balance all the time. And, and I'm very happy to say that I am in, in a good moment for that balance. I feel, I, I still need more time to read now, but I'm still very happy. Yeah, that, actually that was a question we didn't ask uh, regarding your readings, but maybe for a upcoming uh, in-person event in the future. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gabriela, Enrique, thank you a lot for the wonderful presentation, for the talks, for the conversation. We really, really enjoyed. We are going to start looking for auditoriums in Mexico City for the future. <laughs> we'll uh, love to do that. Uh, we really enjoyed this conversation. We are really happy that you have time for that. We really appreciate it. Thank you a lot. Uh, also, thanks uh, to our partners, Skyfriend and Anauco, for supporting this. And also, of course, to the audience for watching and uh, being with us today. Yeah, have a nice afternoon there, a nice evening in Europe for those ones. Um, yeah, thank you a lot for your time. It was a huge pleasure. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Enrique. You. Thank you for me. Thank you, Gabriela. Igualmente. Un beso. Uh, gracias. Un beso. And I want to yeah.